In the last podcast, I argued we can classify stakeholder relationships along a continuum from cooperative to adversarial, depending on the convergence of their own attitudes, issues affecting both the organization and stakeholder, and their views of the relationship with the organization itself. Earlier in this series, I also argued that one of the practical reasons to map an organization's stakeholders was not just to classify the stakeholders themselves, but to also begin to consider the network of relationships between the stakeholders as a way of identifying potential risks and opportunities to manage issues before they become crises. In this podcast, we'll extend this discussion by directly examining the complexities for organizations interacting with their own brand communities, as well as managing their adversaries. When stakeholders view their relationship with an organization generally positively, they may feel like they have a cooperative relationship characterized by a perception of a shared reality between the stakeholders and the organization that includes trust, openness, involvement, investment, and commitment, and it engenders a sense of loyalty between the organization and the stakeholder. Now, while research is mixed when it comes to the impact of good crisis response on the shared reality and loyalty, with some studies showing that crises can strengthen stakeholder trust, loyalty, and commitment to the brand, others have found that response has less of an impact. What remains consistent is that building trustworthy organizations with good reputations and a positive history of interaction consistently improves the outcomes for organizations. So we have to put this into a social media age where organizations increasingly recognize the importance of meaningful engagement with stakeholders across platforms and where social media managers have been identified as critical gatekeepers to organizations' reputations. When we begin to think about how an organization might be in a relationship with its stakeholders, and if our goal is building cooperative relationships, then it shouldn't be hard to connect the notion of community to stakeholder relationship management. There's a rich body of literature that focuses on brand communities, and it's worth talking about the importance of brand communities in a crisis context as well. A brand community, like any traditional community, demonstrates a shared consciousness, rituals, traditions, and a sense of moral responsibility to the brand. They are a social phenomenon with distinctive social structures, and they manifest themselves in virtual contexts, just like face-to-face -face communities, where people demonstrate identification and satisfaction with that community. No doubt we've all seen brands trying to create community with a whole lot of different kinds of gimmicks. And honestly, it's a bit like dad dancing, pretty cringeworthy. So how do we know when we've built a successful brand community and not one that's a bit cringy? There are four characteristics of successful brand communities. First, they're well-structured and well-organized so that they reinforce brand loyalty. We see people time after time with repeat consumers. Second, Brand communities create communities of consumption, and they're characterized by joint values, patterns, and habits of meaning. So consumers join brand communities to interact with people who share similar experiences and passions for a particular brand. Third, brand communities create a psychological sense of community, and that's characterized by trust, support, and the satisfaction of mutual needs. And finally, Brand communities encourage stakeholder interaction, and when they're successful, they create a lot of influence and involvement right across different channels. Not surprisingly, the rise of social media has only amplified and virtually institutionalized the need for organizations to actively participate in their own brand communities. But many people think that social media-based brand communities are just the transfer of traditional brand communities with the same characteristics and markers online for the social media generation. But the truth is that the new forms of brand communities are a lot more interesting and complex. According to some research in social media-based brand communities, they are genuinely characterized as sites providing the members with a sense of freedom and allowing them to converse in various languages, topics, and issues, and they foster an environment that allows for engagement. In short, once the community is established, the brand is not the only topic. People not only identify with the brand, but begin to learn about one another.
and so the brand itself has facilitated the formation of interpersonal relationships and ones that are quite meaningful. So it's not just about consumption and purchasing, it genuinely becomes about social interaction. So let's bring this back to the context of issues and crisis response. When organizations have a strong brand community, that brand community is the organization's first line of defense for two reasons. First, they want to hear the organization's side of the story or are at least willing to consider it. And second, they're very likely to defend the organization. Let me offer you an example based on what happened after Adidas's 2016 Valentine's Day Instagram post. Adidas posted a picture of two women's legs and feet in Adidas shoes with this simple caption, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Though the post was generally received very positive feedback, not surprisingly, there are a minority of responses that were negative, focusing on criticisms of homosexuality and the portrayal of homosexual relationships by the brand. Generally, Adidas didn't actually offer much of a response to the situation but the stakeholders identifying with the community certainly did. Of course, the company would have expected the negative feedback, but they allowed their brand community and activated those aligned with the values they communicated in the post to defend the company and the post. This is a very concrete demonstration of not only brand communities, but how extended stakeholder networks can be activated in the co-creation of shared values, issue mitigation, and even crisis response. While Adidas is an example of how an issue can be managed through an effective brand community, let's take a look at an organization that didn't actually have one and faced a major crisis, BP in the wake of the 2010 explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. We're increasingly finding that companies and stakeholders co-create the narrative about the crisis on social media, that the dialogue developed between them will influence the organization's overall response to the crisis. Yet in 2010, BP didn't have a social media community before the April explosion. Yeah, it had a Facebook account, but it had no posts, and it didn't even have a Twitter account. In short, BP had no social media strategy or engagement before the explosion in the Gulf. Yet in the year after the explosion, it was very clear that not only did it have a brand community that had been created, but that community demonstrated each of those aforementioned characteristics of a brand community. But what my analysis of BP's brand community also demonstrated was that unlike most analyses of these brand communities, BP's Facebook community had varying attitudes about the company, ranging from its supporters to its detractors. Yet the people interacting were generally familiar with one another and they behaved as a community. So while it's possible that the genesis of the community, a major disaster, could shape the nature of the community, I would suggest that when we are talking about these brand communities before, during, or after crises, Organizations have to be prepared for their community's members to have different opinions about the organization and its performance and to join in that conversation. The BP example also demonstrates that framing the discussion in terms of brand communities alone doesn't really fully encompass the nature of social support and engagement that happens as a result of crises. In fact, it also demonstrates that the co-creation of meaning in a crisis and how it emerges with those affected by the crises, well, they seek communities of support. Thing is, those communities of, of support can also emerge into communities of advocacy. In the context of risk, issue, and crisis management, one of the strongest reasons for organizations to pay attention to, develop, and engage with their brand communities and other stakeholders like support groups is because the, it gives them an opportunity to develop more agile and timely messaging to manage public sentiment and public information. In addition, we're also seeing increasing evidence that communities on social media are vital for disaster response because it enables people to communicate with one another, get timely information, help initiate search and rescue operations, and provide emotional support to one another in ways that are otherwise impossible and literally saves lives.
We have seen the importance of virtual community responses to major disasters like floods, and certainly in response to situations like the 2016 Brussels terrorist attack and the 2017 Manchester arena, arena bombing, where the real first responders weren't police, fire, and ambulance, but ordinary people. In many cases, the quick response on social media provided people with safe places to go, ways to get resources, and ways to help people. For example, the Sikh community in Manchester organized rapid response with the assistance to get people to hospital, provide water, and support in the first hours, all on social media. In Belgium, many of the members of the communities opened their homes and businesses as safe harbor for people to go if they were caught up in the chaos. This tells us that brand communities are more than just a sales or marketing tool, but they are something much more potentially meaningful and potentially useful, especially in the context of risk, issue, and crisis management. Obviously, not all relationships between organizations or organizations in different stakeholder groups can be cooperative. Whereas the cooperative relationship represents a balance in the shared realities and loyalties, in adversarial relationships, there's an imbalance. When we think of adversarial relationships between stakeholders and organizations, we should think of those typically characterized by antagonism, opposition, asymmetry of power, and perceived risk. In a lot of ways, 2020 has highlighted antagonistic relationships in a very troubled United States. Whether we're talking about the armed protests in the state governments during the lockdown of people rejecting the health recommendations followed by the rest of the world to remain in quarantine that these states were just trying to maintain, or we're talking about the nationwide protests against police brutality on blacks that was precipitated by George Floyd's murder in Minnesota, we are seeing very public and damaging examples of adversarial relationships between groups. But it's certainly not the first that we've seen these adversarial relationships emerge. We've seen similar issues in organizational contexts in the US in recent years pretty consistently. The importance of brand communities and social media engagement is allowing organizations that understand their value proposition and their stakeholders to take calculated risks. Nike's use of Colin Kaepernick in the 30th anniversary Just Do It campaign demonstrates the complexities of a modern organizational environment, risk management, and the use of advocacy to create and counter social, organizational, and political challenges. Kaepernick became a household name in the U.S. not for his play as a National Football League or NFL quarterback, but for his social statement of kneeling during the U.S. National Anthem that is played at the start of every NFL football game. For many Americans, including the NFL and the U.S. President Donald Trump, this marked an enormous sign of disrespect towards the country. For Kaepernick, it represented a statement against racial injustice and police brutality. Clearly, when Nike launched their campaign in 2018, two years after Kaepernick first gained headlines for the kneeling, it got attention and with predictions that it would hurt the company's profits. However, that clearly wasn't the case with the company's online sales growing and estimates of $6 billion worth of sales directly attributable to the campaign itself being reported. So why does a campaign that was risky garner global attention for a sport that is mostly irrelevant outside of North America and maybe a few places in Europe? Well, the narrative, the timing, and the subject matter. Nike was able to position themselves as an adversary to issues that reasonable people would oppose, racial injustice and police brutality. But more than that, the company was able to indirectly criticize a globally unpopular political figure, President Trump, while also potentially creating a reputational problem for another organization, the NFL. This campaign exemplifies the complexities of modern, multi-platform, multi-actor environments, but also lets me introduce the concept of counter-branding into the domain of issues and risk management as well as crisis response. When we think of branding, we think of building positive relationships between stakeholders and the targeted company, product, service, or behavior. 
So if we think of counter branding, we should think about it as a negative messaging strategy to attempt to harm existing positive relationships or simply build adversarial relationships between stakeholders and the targeted company, product, service, or even behavior. Counter branding isn't new. As a distinctive competitive strategy, it appeared in 7-Up's 1967 campaign that branded itself the Uncola. We've seen it applied in hosts of contexts over the years, from commercial applications by competitors to political advertising, and certainly traditional social protest and advocacy campaigns like those to stop fracking in both the United States and the United Kingdom. The underlying assumption with counter branding is that no matter how big a brand might be in the public's mind, there's always an open spot for exactly the opposite. One of the most successful examples of counterbranding is the American Legacy Foundation's Truth.com campaign. In 1997, the four largest tobacco companies in the United States were successfully sued and had to pay over $200 billion in damages over 25 years. As a result, the American Legacy Foundation was created in order to try and target and reduce teen smoking as one of its principal objectives. Yet, instead of in only targeting health-related behaviors, the Truth.com ads also targeted the tobacco industry because consumers prefer to support brands who share their values. Let's take a look at one of their early ads from around 2001 or 2002. The legacy campaign emphasized truth as their brand, suggesting that messages promoting cigarettes were lies and argued that the messages offered by the tobacco industry were incomplete, misleading, and often inaccurate representations of both cigarettes and smoking. The strategy was effective with campaign analyses demonstrating significant reduction in youth smoking as a result of this multifaceted approach. So if we take the truth campaign out of a health context and put it into a crisis context, what the Legacy Foundation was able to do was create a very successful reputational crisis for the tobacco industry. More than just a message strategy, counter branding represents the opposite side of the advocacy coin to brand communities. Instead of supporting the organization, stakeholders can easily advocate against it. This is what the critics of the Adidas's Valentine's Instagram post and certainly what the opponents of Nike's Just Do It campaign were trying to do. Moreover, this can happen also within a brand community, as I found evidence in the BP brand community on Facebook. Functionally, we should think of activism as any kind against an organization, as counter branding really, because it represents stakeholders trying to shape other stakeholders' attitudes about an organization to such an extent that it changes the dynamic in the relationship between the stakeholder and the organization. The degree to which organizations respond to the reputational attacks will depend on the risk they believe that the counter rep branding represents to the, their own relationships with the stakeholders that matter to them. In recent years, there have been a growing number of examples of activism and counterbranding that have threatened the relationships between organizations and their vital stakeholders, forcing a response and even changes to the organization. Yet a challenge for organizations is how to decide which of these that they should respond to, if any, and how they should respond. For example, in 2014, an offensive tagline, 
serving shit to scum for over 70 years, appeared on British Baker's Greg's Wikia profile, and that's the summary that appears when people do a Google search for the company. Of course, Greg's had nothing to do with it, and the culprits were never found. But not surprisingly, this is one piece of counterbranding that required a response. Greg's social media team responded to thousands of Twitter messages in such a humorous way that the talk became about how well Greg's responded, as opposed to talking about the offensive logo. They not only used humor, but also pulled Google into the conversation to demonstrate a credible response and to clearly state that the problem wasn't their fault. The full conversation helped to diffuse the situation, demonstrated goodwill on both Greg's and Google's parts in managing the situation. Of course, the example demonstrates that humor can be an effective strategy, especially on social media, as it captures the attention and helps people and organizations stand out from all the digital noise. But beyond the response strategy, the Greg's case also demonstrates the complexity of modern organizational environments where organizations have to manage multiple relationships at a time and often through contexts, complaints, and advocacy that's just frankly difficult to predict. In the last six decades, there's been a growing and diverse body of research on crises. However, the voice that's often forgotten in this body of research is that of the whistleblower. We seldom get a glimpse into the employee experience, their decision to stay silent or blow the whistle, and what happens after the crisis emerges to them. Yet this is an important act of counterbranding because the stakeholder is not just complaining about an organization, but is making serious accusations about their own organization that have likely been ignored internally, so they take them outside the organization to ensure that the problems or risks are addressed. This underscores a point that crises are challenging because they represent the intersection of many stakeholder voices and perspectives on an organization or situation. Thinking about whistleblowing as another form of counterbranding helps us to understand that the relationships between crisis issues, stakeholders, and the organization are multi-layered and frankly semi-fluid. When an employee decides to bring to public attention an internal problem within the organization, the question of blame attribution is both easy and difficult to answer. It's easy because it's a transgression, a situation where the organization has clearly done something wrong. Yet because it's also triggered by a whistleblower, other stakeholders, both inside and outside the organization, may not view the whistleblower as a hero. Rather, they may view him or her as a villain or at least a problem to deal with. This makes blame attribution less of a question about the facts of the situation and more a question of perception and competing interests. Whistleblowing also represents a fundamental breakdown in the relationship between one organizational stakeholder, one of its own, and the organization with repercussions of that relationship often being played out in the public eye. Whistleblowing also provides an important and often ignored narrative about transgressions in organizations. And that's the emotional journey that employees take through crisis. So no matter whether they're whistleblowing or just trying to make sense of events as they unfold, in crisis communication, we often focus exclusively on external stakeholders, ignoring employee voices and perspectives. And this is vital to managing issues and crises alike. For a more detailed case study in whistleblowing, take a look at the supplemental podcast for this chapter, chapter 13, on the case of Norsk tipping.